Hey everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jack Bowie, I'm a city councilor. Um, welcome to the board meeting. If you are not on the email list to be notified of board meetings, we have a sign-in sheet right here for your name and your email address. Uh, we also have cookies, hand sanitizer, and napkins. Um, and we have quite a bit of information at the table as well. Uh, the HR department who is here with Assistant Director Chris Shipp has provided all the uh, current job openings in the city for anyone who's interested or anyone who knows anyone. Um, we also have information from the Department of Veteran Services and from the Mayor's Office. Uh, we are currently really pushing to fill a lot of vacancies in boards and committees. Um, so we have, you know, things about each board. So zoning board, what does zoning board do? Planning board, what does the planning board do? Like that, and listing what we have for openings. So I'd encourage you to take a look at it. If you have any interest, I would definitely recommend that you reach out to the mayor's office uh, to talk about volunteering for one of those boards. I wanted to, you know, start off with that little bit of housekeeping. Um, a little update about Stop and Shop. Right now, we are still basically where we were before, making overtures to the landlord and to Stop and Shop Corporate, trying to see if we can reach a middle ground or help them reach a middle ground. Um, Mr. Mayor, if you are around, the, the mayor as the executive of the city has been uh, you know, operating as, as our negotiator as he should. So I'll pass the microphone over to him um, and then we'll get, I'll explain the layout of what we're doing today. Thank you, Councilor. Good evening. It's not for Jack, you know, not for me, or for me, and all this. I want to first of all thank you for being here. A lot of people would be coming out on a beautiful night. I mean, this is unprecedented. But um, the Councilor, myself, Councilor Isaac, who's here, and uh, Greg Hanley, who is the town manager over at Holbrook, and also the new state rep, Rita Mendez, had a meeting recently at City Hall. We're all against this absurdity of closing stock and shop. It makes no sense. It truly makes no sense. Uh, it's, it's not just a supermarket, it's a pharmacy, it's a bank, it's a gas station, it's everything. And so it's, um, it's incumbent upon us as elected officials to put the pressure on. Um, you know, I have uh, sent a letter to the CEO. They finally responded this afternoon. It took a long time. Maybe because Chris Holmes is here from the Enterprise. He wrote a story about it. But I do have a call tomorrow afternoon with one of their corporate advisors. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep everybody in the loop what they tell me. Um, while I'm here, I also just want to tell you another thing. The Brockton Hospital, of course, is closed. Right? It's closed. And uh, I want to thank Brian Adeli, who's running a little late, but he'll be here to chief. A lot of people don't know how serious that fire was. Uh, that was a 10 alarm fire, and if the fire doors had not held up, we would have lost a lot of people that day, last Tuesday. A lot of people would have perished. So again, the brave men and women that were here running in the building, and of course the wonderful staff that was inside. I can't even imagine how scary and frightening that was. But since then, I've had about five meetings with the folks over at Brockton Hospital Signature. I also have been having regular meetings with Good Samaritan Medical Center because now Brockton's closed and Good Sam's getting wham whammed and in influx of patients and also South Shore. And so there's a burnout rate with the, uh, the men and women that work over there. So just yesterday, I had asked uh, 60 different people to come for a round table at the Shaw Center. And it was a strategy session. Like, we need, number one, to get Brockton Hospital back up as soon as possible. That's a goal. We have to do that. Now, when the Cardinal Cushing on the west side burnt 28 years ago, that was offline for a year and a half. Now, we had the daughter, right, on the, on the Brockton Stoke line at that time to kind of do the flow. So, know that we're working diligently with the Brockton Hospital folks. We're also working diligently with Governor, uh, Governor and Lieutenant Governor Maura Healy and Kim Driscoll to work in humans with us. Uh, Ex Executive Office of Health and Human Services, the Secretary came and met with us yesterday, the VA met with us, BNZ met with us, Father Bills met with us, Senator Mike Brady and all the delegation, the free reps and the Senator where we're all on the same page. The thing is the staffing in the space. So it's a critical, critical, I call it a crisis. It's a medical emergency right now, not to have two hospitals in the city of Brockton. So I don't have a magic time frame uh, to tell you when it's going to be operational. There's a lot of rumors. 
It's going to be up and running in three months, six months, a year, two years. I don't know. That hasn't been shared with me. But I can tell you that we are working extremely hard to try to fast track that. The other thing we have to remember, though, is there is a delay on supply chain. So the electrical system at the hospital is gone. It, it burnt, it's fried. I was there at the fire the whole time. We kept hearing these explosions. I kept asking the chief, what is that? That was the electrical surge when everything was getting shot. So number one, no one got hurt, thank God. 160 people were evacuated, including two women in active labor. Uh, so that's a good thing. The bad news is it's down, and we have to figure out collectively, politically, and corporate-wise, how we can get that back up. But in the meantime, we have to make sure we can lessen the burden on South Shore in Good Samaritan Medical Center. So that, that was just an update I wanted to give this clip as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so now I'll uh, run through the format real quick. Uh, at some of your tables, you'll find a number and hopefully a rose in the face as well. Uh, we're we're going to play a little department head speed dating. So please, if you are not, I know, it's the two days after Valentine's Day, we're going with it. Uh, so this is a new idea that I, I wanted to try out. Uh, you know, typically when we have a ward meeting, yeah, you know, uh, the guests, will stand out front, they'll explain who they are, they'll take a couple of questions, and they'll sort of be out of time, and they'll, they'll keep going. I'm hoping that this will give us a more personal opportunity to have these department heads interacting with folks. Uh, we're going to leave one seat, at least one seat open per table, and then at a certain amount of time, we're gonna swap the department heads out. So a department head will visit your table, They'll introduce themselves, they'll explain a bit about who they are, what they do, take some questions, and then they're going to, you know, uh, go to the next table once time's up. So I'm hoping that this gives, you know, everyone a, a more personal opportunity to meet and interact with some of these folks. Uh, so if you are not at a table with a number, I would ask that you head to one. Uh, but please leave table number nine open. In order to get this filmed and recorded to the folks at home, I'm going to have a conversation with the department heads as part of their route, and we'll use table nine for that. Oh, so I'm Jack Lally. I'm your city councilor. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think that we have an interesting format here. Uh, and. I'm looking forward to seeing how it works. But, you know, the goal is to put people uh, closer to the department heads, uh, let them, you know, meet these folks, talk to these folks, uh, and you know, hopefully learn a lot more about some of the departments that keep the city moving forward. Um, you know, I I'm not going to be able to riff for all for all nine minutes that we've got, um, but I I am hoping that this works out. Uh, pretty well. Uh, it's experimental, but you know, trying new things, thinking outside of the box, is part of the the deal. Um, I can tell you from my uh, you know from my end of it, um, you know, a, lot, a couple of things we're working on right now would be uh, you know stop and shop. Uh, we have sort of plan A, plan B, and plan C when it comes to stop and shop, uh, and they're considering leaving the city. Uh, number one is we are going to try and see if we can get them to stay. You know, we're contacting Stopping Shop, we're contacting uh, the landlord that increased the rent, and we're trying to get them to reach some middle ground. Option number two, if, if uh, you know, Stop and Shop is unwilling to stay, our plan B is we are going to try and solicit another supermarket. We'd like to keep that area with somewhere uh, for people to walk to get, uh, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and everything else they need. Uh, the fear is that Stop and Shop leaving creates a bit of a food desert. Uh, there's a lot of people who can walk to Stop and Shop who wouldn't really be able to walk many other places. So that's what we're working on. Option three, if we can't find another supermarket, we're going to want somebody to move in there. Uh, it would not be very good at all for us to actually have an empty location, completely empty. So that's what we're working on in, in that order. Um, 
something else that we're really focusing on is uh, foot joy. The foot joy building down in the village has been purchased. Somebody plans to, um, I believe, knock it over and build something brand new there. We want to make sure that stays uh, something positive, but uh, you know, preferentially something, you know, business, commercial, uh, that isn't a negative impact on the neighborhood, but can pay, uh, you know, commercial taxes. We've been building a lot of residential properties. The city is in high demand when it comes to people moving in here. Uh, we have over 500 units of housing uh, on the way. It's some phase in construction. Um, and a lot of these places have waiting lists. A lot of these apartments have people who are, really want to come in. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, we have to balance that. We have to balance that with business, and we need to grow our, our business strength in the core of our, our city. Um, you have too few business, too many residential properties, and you wind up with the world's largest bedroom community. And we're, we're close to that. We have a lot of residential. So as long as it can, as long as it's something that I think, you know, would work well, as long as it's something that would, um, you know, be a, a positive on the neighborhood, we would like to see if we can attract some commercial development. Um, some of the other things that we're really focusing on right now, uh, you know, we have the high school project that we're doing. Uh, we've worked with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Uh, they actually had to redo their entire uh, manner of, of budgeting in order to account for the high school. It's, it's uh, such a large high school that if they tried to fund their portion of it completely in one year, um, they would not be able to support any other school building project across the entire state for the year. So they've redesigned how they're operating uh, and we are moving forward with um, you know the high school. So they are going to fund a significant portion of it, I believe 80%. We'll have the superintendent who can, who can cover that for us as well. Uh, and then the city will be responsible to find out how to pay for the remainder, which is still a significant amount of money, so that is a big challenge ahead of us. We can try bonding money out to cover it. Um, and we can try, you know, seeing if we can work out a portion of the budget each year to pay off that bond. But if we don't bond it, we're running, you know, low on options. Um, the option of a sort of uh, a tax increase, uh, an override, a two and a half override, has been floated. Um, I have personally said that I would not be in favor of that and I would not vote for it, uh, but that is one of the other options if it isn't bonding. Uh, so we're working very hard to make sure that we have the bond capacity necessary to cover this and that we can make it work because the city has no interest in a two and a half override. Things are tough as it is, that would, that would help nobody. So we are working to fight that uh, and find a better way to push forward. One of the biggest things that, that we deal with is uh, infrastructure and infrastructure problems. We have the commissioner, Pat Hill, here to talk about that as well. Uh, but we're really trying to focus on replacing pipes as much as we can uh, and repaving the roads above them. There are four ways, really, that we repave roads. Number one is with money from the gas company. When the gas company goes and does their pipes under a road, uh, they used to leave that little thin, narrow strip of pavement when they patched, and that was unpleasant for everybody. The city is now asking them to either pave the entire half of the road under which they operated, or we are asking them to kick in a pretty decent chunk of change and that will go towards us repaving the road completely. Uh, for example, that is what we did with Ames Street. The gas company didn't repave half of it. They left the narrow strip, gave us a large sum of money, and then we were able to put in a little bit of city money and repave the street. Uh, option number two on how to pave a road is uh, from the state, Chapter 90. 
Chapter 90 funds are, I'm just checking the time, Chapter 90 funds are basically the state and federal government's way to pay us a, a lump sum every year with which we can only use to pave roads and fix sidewalks. There are two other options, it has to do with your water and sewer bill, and we'll touch on that after, but i got to move everybody out. I'm, I'm now here with the city clerk, Tim Cruz. Good evening. So, you know, I wanted to, you know, turn the floor over to Tim for the folks at home. Uh, you know, tell us a bit about, about yourself, uh, you know, your, what the clerk does, and what you've been looking to do with the department. I know you've really pushed to, uh, you know, make some, some upgrades. Um, you know, uh, Tim's predecessor as city clerk, Tony Zioli, was clerk for a while. He did a fantastic job. Uh, actually, Tony's the one that signed my birth certificate. Um, and then he was the clerk while I was a counselor, so it was very nice. But, uh, you know, when when a new person comes in, they want to put their, you know, their mark on the office. And, uh, you know, Tim, I always say, was really built for this job. So we're, we're excited to see what he does with it. So take it away, Mr. Clerk. So it's nice to be here. This is a great idea because as a 15-year city councilor who had many ward meetings and didn't have as many as some people think would think they should, they can become very redundant and very hard to keep interesting. Uh, but this is a great idea where the, the department heads are going around to speak with small groups. So I, I commend you. Um, for you, those at home that don't know me, I was a city councilor for 15 years. I'm a 66-year-old Brocktonian, been here my whole life. And after my 15 years in the council, uh, Clerk Zioli, who was here for 30 years and was a wonderful city clerk, uh, decided to retire. So I reached out to, uh, well, actually, he reached out to me to take over as assistant city clerk. And then I reached out to the councilors who elect the, the city clerk. I, uh, I'm elected by the city council. I'm the clerk to the council, as you know. And my office is kind of twofold. One side is taking care of the city council, the agendas and the minutes of the meetings and running the meetings, understanding Robert's rules of, of, of law. And, uh, and then the other side is we're the keeper of the records for the city. All birth certificates, death certificates, uh, uh, so many of the death certificates, marriage certificates. Uh, in fact, I do marriages. I'm a justice of the peace. As a, you have to, uh, by state law, the city clerk has to be a justice of the peace, and uh, which is a, a part of the job I enjoy. It's great to see see people come in on a happy day. Um, it's uh, I love the job. First of all, I have a phenomenal staff. Um, you talked about. Tony Zioli being here signing your uh, your uh, birth certificate in the history of the city of a hundred uh, became a city in 1881. There were only only the 13th city clerk. Oh boy! I don't in, intend to be a Mr. Zioli, who again was phenomenal. Was there a long time? I don't intend to be there anywhere near that well, that amount of time. We'll keep you as long as we can have you. That's uh, that's impressive. And, and for context, in the in the time where there have been 13 city clerks, there have been 50 mayors of the correct, city. Correct. So now we now we know the staying power of the clerk. It's a, it's a very detailed job, very detail oriented, very law oriented. What we do is set by state law, in some cases federal law. I'm the keeper of all public records that are not mentioned specifically somewhere else. So we get freedom of information requests basically all day, every day. Many get sent to other departments because they're not something that we're the keeper of, but uh, we're the keeper of zoning decisions, zoning board of appeals decisions, planning board decisions. We're the, I'm the keeper of the uh, of the zoning map, the official zoning map, which we're in the middle of updating and fixing right now. Uh, the, the, the official map that we have is from 1965 right now and there have been many changes which only can happen through the city council. Lots of people say, why don't we do this, why don't we do that? Uh, only the city council can institute a zoning change. Um, so we are in the middle with the new city's new GIS director uh, and Howard Newton from the engineering department who's been in the city for 60 years. And it's been awesome because he remembers everything, literally can find a he's piece an of paper. He's an institution. Oh, yeah. One of these days he'll retire, so that's why we need to make sure everything is, everything is there. We have records dating back to 1880 in my office. We do have something stored off-site. Uh, all records are not public records. Some people don't understand that. Uh, 
some birth certificates are not a public record. Anybody can come in and get post birth certificates or marriage certificates or death certificates. We do charge $24 for a certified copy. We get very busy right now because people are trying to get their real ID driver's license and they need a, a certified copy of their, of their birth certificate. A lot of people have their birth certificate but it's not a certified copy. So they, we have a lot of people coming in right now uh, looking for those. Uh, some of the things I am trying to do, um, some of the updates I've made are more behind the scenes, but right now we only take cash or money order. Uh, soon we'll take, uh, we won't, we started to take checks in too many bills, but we will be set up fairly soon to take credit cards and okay, okay. probably debit cards. We're not right now, but within another, probably two months we'll be set up to do that. Um, Perfect. So it's, uh, we'll also hopefully be set up for people to make an application online. Right now they can send an email in and we can help them out with their driving, I mean their uh, birth certificate or death certificate or, or wedding uh, marriage certificate. But uh, we're not set up to, for them to apply online. Well, I have a, actually I have a uh, conference call tomorrow, I know, I'm sorry, Monday afternoon. Regarding that with another company, I've looked at a couple of companies, and I've met with some of the other city clerks in the in the state to uh, see what they use for uh, that process. So we're trying to update that somewhat, but uh, you know we'll handle uh, about 12,000 certified copies of certificates this year, which for the staff of seven, with everything else we have to do is is a testament to what a great staff I do have. So, as the mayor would say, yeoman's work. Yeoman's work, yeoman's absolutely. Work. They, uh, I just try to get there, give them the tools they need to get out of the way. Most of them have been there quite a while, and some of them are newer. Also very proud of, in the office right now, we can speak Portuguese, Spanish, Cape Verdean, Creole. We don't have Haitian Creole right now. Hopefully we'll feel it soon on the next hire, next I hope. To guarantee that, but we, we do have translation services if we need them. Yeah. But uh, it, it's nothing to have five, six languages being spoken in my, uh, in my front counter on any particular day. And uh, we, we, it's important because when people, it's tough enough for them to come in and look for these certificates when they don't really know sometimes what they're looking for. But if they have to do it in a second language, we want to make it as easy as we can for them. And, uh, Again, I'm proud of my staff for doing it. I, I received countless calls and cards thanking uh, thanking my staff for how uh, how accommodating they've been. So uh, some of the bigger things, and then again, the other side is working with you in the council. Council, as you were the council president last year, when well, they did a great job. But we have to uh, make sure that anything that gets filed for an ordinance or an order is legally worded, that it's legal legal document. I'm the keeper of the city seal, which seals city documents, and uh, it, we don't use that light. We're now live. No, uh, I'm now with city solicitor Megan Bridges. Uh, Madam Solicitor, Hello. good to see you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, have you for been, hosting. Have you been finding speed dating so far? You know, it's getting a great reception. It's really nice to have a little bit more intimate conversation with people. And multiple people. Yeah, I, I always I always found that some people would really want to ask some questions, but there were some very inquisitive, good-natured but inquisitive people who would kind of get more of the time. So, so hopefully this way folks get a little more chance to sort of be themselves and have a more personal interaction. But uh, you know, for the folks at home, we're going to be watching this online and on on cable access. You know, tell us a bit about yourself, a bit about your department, you know, what, you, what you've been up to, uh, what you're shooting for. Well, you know, thank you for having me. Um, and my name is Megan Bridges. I'm the city solicitor. Um, that is, I think, an English term for a lawyer. Um, so that's what I am, a lawyer. I'm the head of the city's law department. Six lawyers work for me, um, and the license commission is also under the law department. Um, we have a great administrative support staff also. And our main role is providing legal advice to departments, the mayor, boards or commissions, um, and defending the city in lawsuits. 
Uh, we do a variety of work from code enforcement, litigation, um, defending personal injury actions, and uh, pretty much everything in between. Concom enforcement is some of the things I've had an opportunity to talk about. Conservation, with, yeah. Yes, the oh. Conservation Commission um, and enforcement related to those actions is a new endeavor for the city that my office is undertaking. Uh, we did a lot of work on the Conservation Commission ordinance for enforcement that's making its way through the channels now. Uh, my office is intimately involved in the public safety construction project um, and public construction is a very interesting component of the job. I personally, I'm a person, I live in Brockton, I'm married, I have three kids. Uh, I love my job. I love I love living and working in the city. I'm from Florida, so this is the only place I've ever lived other than my hometown. And this year, I'm looking really I'm for, looking forward to working with the city's code enforcement teams, um, from building to fire to the board of health, um, and also I'm attempting to anytime the city resolves. A, a case, a lawsuit, pre-litigation, post-litigation, trying to determine the cost savings for the city in, in the resolution. So if the exposure was X and we resolved it for Y, I'd love to be able to talk to the public about the difference in that cost savings. Which would make a lot of sense, yeah. You know, if, if somebody sues the city for $10 million and there's a you know, a legitimate beef, but there's a $3 million dollar settlement, you know, you save the city $7 million. That, that all, makes that sense. Is. So one of the things that uh, you mentioned recently in a city council meeting was that you were shifting money from settlements to defense uh, as part of, you know, the city's, you know, defending itself uh, stronger, more often. Uh, and pushing back on on things that you know the city may have won otherwise. There was a, a story in uh, Governing Magazine a while ago that said that 20 of the 25 largest cities in America combined paid out about 12 billion dollars a year in settlements on cases that the law departments in those cities felt they actually could have won, that you know the city wasn't in the wrong in, they were just too overwhelmed and were unable to address it. So you know maybe if you'd want to say something about you know the shift that that you're taught that you're putting forward. Yes. The business of litigation is just that it's business. So sometimes matters do. Um, do deserve a nuisance value or some type of nominal settlement value. Um, with the council's support of the expansion of my office, we've had more people and resources and time to defend cases um, that potentially could have been settled for nuisance value because of a volume problem. Um, but. Thankfully, we have folks who have time and dedication to the cases. And as the counselor mentioned, my office most recently made a request to transfer some money from what I have appropriated as uh, judgment money that we thankfully have not had to use um, this far into the fiscal year. So the counselor has hit it spot on the head that because of resources, a municipality is not a private firm. We don't always have the greatest, tech, the latest and greatest technology. We don't have always the latest and greatest software or the ability to just only care about the bottom line. There's a lot more concerns, um, and you have to prioritize your priorities. Now, with more staff, we are able to uh, fight more, and it doesn't cost the city any more money because we're doing it internally. Yeah, the, the shift in staff was a big thing. Um, the city solicitor position itself was only very recently made a full-time position as well, which I, I think uh, really helps us in terms of commitment. You know, you have somebody who's there, you know, all day, and, and we're their only client. This the city of Brockton, uh, you know, the people within it. That is true. You know, that's, that's, a big, that's a big step. 
um, I, I'm fortunate I have a very dedicated staff and I live where I work so I care about what I do on a personal level as well as a professional level and I think that makes a difference uh, and, and also through the mayor's support and leadership he's been very vocal about wanting to create an internal law firm and I think we've really done just that. When people ask me what I do for work I say you know just like big companies like Kellogg or Nike have in-house counsel, general counsel, that is what I am, that is what I do just for a government entity. Um, a city of over 110,000 people with a budget of over 500 million dollars. So that is the level of work that the law department participates in. Um, and I'm fortunate to work alongside you. Thank you. No, uh, we've got a lot of things that you know the city solicitor does, you know, on behalf of the public. Uh, the, the city council is a legislature. A legislature. We are elected to represent our constituents. We go, we represent, we vote on their behalf, we speak on their behalf, um, and we advocate for issues that you know that are important to our communities. Um, and the city solicitor in her office has been. Uh, a tremendous help to us on a couple of, of key issues up here. Um, and we've only got, I was just checking the time, we've got about a minute left, but um, I believe the city is in court on, on at least two properties in the ward, maybe three, uh, with which the owner or developer has, has been a little troublesome or difficult. Um, I know we've, I don't know if you want to run with it. No, I talked to some folks at one of the tables about Remova Park and about New Heights. Um, DEP is certainly playing a role in these issues too, but the city is at the table taking the developer um, through the course of litigation related to the activities at the properties. Um, and and you know, on a more positive note, um, as Councillor Lally acknowledged some of the work my office does, um, not all the time are we a defendant, sometimes we're a plaintiff. Um, we recovered money for the city from uh, opioid abuse and a class action lawsuit related to that. We're involved in a class action lawsuit for PFAS contamination and um, Student, Opportunity Act. Student Opportunity Act, Juul litigation, um, the vaping products. So my office you know, works on behalf of yeah, what is your report to you. And we are the, uh, the developer for uh, Remova is taking away the dirt that is being monitored and they are going to the planning board uh, shortly to begin the process of actually building the complex, which is which is good to hear. Nope, so we have Fire Chief Nardelli with us right now. Chief, good to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. How you been? Doing all right. Good. Getting older, getting older. Yeah. Uh, the chief was a little bit late um, for the best of reasons, chief. If you want to hit it real quick. So we're, we're graduating a we're graduating a class tomorrow of firefighters. So they have a dinner. Uh, local 144 puts on a dinner for them the night before. So um, I, I wanted to make sure I stopped in and uh, you know thank them all that we it's ability for everyone to meet their families and things of that nature. So I was able to go in real quick and talk and um, then make my way up here. Perfect, perfect. And uh, before you came, the mayor did. I uh, talk about the fire at Brockton Hospital. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to hit that, like just gloss over it real quick or, or whatever. Uh, you know, I think that's something that people are going to be Absolutely. still asking about. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things, um, obviously, a very interesting fire. I, I have to start out with the, with the thanks for all of the members of the Brockton Fire Department and all the surrounding towns. <laughs> when I say surrounding towns, as far north. As, as far west as Framingham, as far north, as, far north as um, upwards of north of Boston. We have Brookline in the city of Brockton. Um, also, we, we have what's called the state fire mobilization plan that was activated. So we had not only the 10 alarms that ended up in the city, but we also had four task forces, which consisted of uh, uh, six engines and, and uh, two ladder companies. Uh, and, and it shows the support we receive in the fire service, not only here from our, our, our immediate mutual aid partners, but also to the Commonwealth as a well. whole. Um, and, and the people that came before me as chiefs did set a lot of this stuff up. So, um, it, it, trust me, it was, a, it, was a, it was a difficult fire. Obviously, it was a power issue that we had to get power. So, the fire, the fire was, the, the, 
the, the fire was pretty miraculous. So again, our membership, uh, one of the things I say, it, not everyone that left that building had not one hair hurt on their head. And I was explaining earlier, um, I was involved as a paramedic in the uh, evacuation of Cardinal uh, Cushing at the time, which is now Good Samaritan. Um, and, 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 you know, obviously commanding, it's a whole different animal. Um, but um, the, the, it was very clear because of the power situation they would not be able to operate on their building services. Carbon dioxide started rising in the buildings. So we had to make sure we got the, uh, the patients out in a safe manner. Everyone came together. We split the building in half. We had what's called basically called the dirty side and the clean side. The clean side was where the patients were going to go and get out. Yeah. The dirty side was the side where we would fight the fire and take care of the building systems. One of the things that I think goes unnoticed is the care and dedication of that staff at the Rockin Hospital. Um, I wasn't able to interact with them as much as I as much as I could. But if you're watching, I think you have no idea the debt of gratitude I have for your dedication and care of your patients and um, advocacy for your patients. I think you know healthcare providers are in a position to make so much change, and they were a lot. They allowed us to be able to take take move the patients out, but they were able to care for them at the same time. And and in, I don't mean in a caring way that they were just caring for them in a loving, caring way. They they really truly cared about where their patients were going, what was going on with them, how they were being handled. And you know we're in there with protective care. If something goes wrong, we have the ability to protect ourselves. They did not, and they 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 were they were true professionals, caring, passionate people to the very end. And I think, you know, so much made about the hospital and the fire and what's going to happen next, and I understand that, and, uh, and, and I can't heap enough praise on, on the members of my department, but I think when you really look at the big picture, there were people in that building doing great things all over the place that weren't just us. So yeah. it, was, it was everyday people and nurses and doctors and everyone. All involved, you know, get everybody out. Yes. Not a, not a hair harmed is incredible. Yes. yes. It's incredible. We're you proud know, of that. I, I imagine the department's going to have some folks calling, looking for yes. advice, reforming their plans. Yes, I, I, I have I have I have received a multitude of emails and phone calls. Um, people who have hospitals. I actually spoke with the chief from I think it was Bozeman, Montana, the other day. Oh, boy. so just a little further west of uh, us, and they they wanted to know how it went and what the you know you know what what can we do? And I and I my biggest thing was everyone in, as far as the firefighting component of it. Everyone stayed on task. Everyone stayed on point. Everyone knew what they had to do. They were given an order. They followed the order. The greatest thing about the incident command system that's been set up for many years now is I basically talked to six people. I talked to two deputy chiefs and, and four other chiefs. Two that are in staging, two that are out front, and the two upstairs. And then my liaison chief was the chief of uh, women, Chief Clancy. And we basically, I was able to talk to them. As they got the job done, I was able to control it from a, from a, from a, from a distance that I could see the bigger picture. Yeah, birds that view. Yeah. Well, oh, I, I, I got to say, you know, the discipline of the department is, is incredible. I had the opportunity uh, several months ago to do a ride along yes. with, with the That's department. That's right. I think you had fun, um, didn't you? I did, I did. All right, good. I saw a real fire. Yeah. Um, but the one of the things that, that was very impressive was uh, the, the firefighters responded to a call of a, of a car accident. Um, the call may have been a little exaggerated. Uh, there was actually no noticeable damage to either car. Um, but, you know, the procedure is, and they raced right out there. Uh, and the engine had no sooner turned around and was on its way back, and, and the firefighters were just having a conversation. Um, when a call came in for an apartment that was on fire on Oak Street, and the change was instantaneous. It, everything dropped mid-sentence, mid-word, mid-syllable. Everything dropped, and they immediately jumped into action. Uh, while the engine was in motion, they were preparing themselves to immediately enter the building. Sure. Um, and that's a that's an incredible level of discipline that's that's been instilled. Um, but you know, we do have a couple more minutes. Yeah. Uh, if you want to do a little bit more about the, the fire service or yeah, sure. uh, some of the accomplishments so far that you're proud of or things yeah. that you're really working towards, yeah. Yeah. you know. So so one of the big things is obviously the greatest thing about the fire service. Why I one of the reasons I joined the fire service and wanted to be part of the fire service because when people call us, we show up. It doesn't matter whether you are you are desperately in need of us, whether you think you're in need of us, whether where you live in the city, whatever you do, what it doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter what religion you belong to, the fire service always responds and takes care of the problem. And that's what I love about it. That's what is true and near and dear to my heart. 
one of the initiatives we're pushing forward now, we're graduating the class, but we received a federal grant um, for, for 60 new firefighters um, for the next three years, and um, it's going to allow us to put a 10 uh, piece of apparatus back in service, which has been missing since 1991. Oh, yeah. Anyone who watches the council meetings, you know, I've been beating this drum for a year and a half since I, since I took over, and one of the great things is now we received the actual piece of apparatus through an assistance firefighter grant. We received the staffing for an assistance fire through the SAFER grant. Um, um, safe, safer meaning for um, the standards to make sure we make firefighting safer on the fire ground to be able to put more staff on. And, um, and, and hopefully once this class graduates we're going to have the ability to put this piece of apparatus in service. So I hope you're there for the ribbon cutting of getting the 10th company back I'll do in my best. The Absolutely. The Champions. Well, the, the, the dismissal of the company predates me. I wanna, that's right. That's right. This will be right. the first that's time good. we've that's had good. Yeah. That's good. I so, just graduated from high school in that house. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, it's important. The One of the things that really blew me away was uh, we had a couple of years ago uh, Senator Markey came to Station 3 yep. um, and he was delivering some grant money yep. and one of the things that he talked about were our stats. You know, our responses, our response rate, uh, you know, the fire department has a one of the highest, you know, response rates and performance levels in the uh, in the country, yeah, we pride which ourselves. gives you a, a little bit of a benefit sure. on your home insurance. Yes, uh, and, and the response per capita was, was one of the highest in the country. Yeah, yeah beat, we beat New York, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's because of our condensedness of our city with the amount of runs we do. So yes. Fair enough. Fair enough. Are you you looking forward to the new station? I am. I am. I you know I love I love I've been in station one my entire career except for now um, since I moved on. But, but yes, I am looking forward to it. It's, it's been a lot of work. It's, it's a labor love. I've been working on it before I even made chief. So hey, perfect. Yeah, awesome. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank chief. you. We're switching it up. I'm in the other seat now. But we're here with DPW Commissioner Pat Hill. Commissioner, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, sir. No. Um, now, the DPW is a bunch of different departments wearing a trench coat. It kind is. Of. Um, I don't know if you'd want to just say to the, the folks at home, uh, the departments within the department. So we have uh, the water department, the sewer department, um, the highway department, the refuse department, the forestry department, the maintenance division of the highway department, the engineering division, and um, a fairly substantial size car. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd want to start it off by just, you know, introducing yourself, tell us a bit about, you know, you, the department. Wherever so, you want to take it. All right. So I'm uh, Patrick Hill. I've been with the city for uh, 27 years. Um, I've started my life here in DPW and I've worked my way through the ranks and um, rose to the, the job of commissioner. Um, you know, we're, we're a real, real busy department. We got a lot of projects going on all the time. You know, and um, you know, we, this year we get probably three or four miles of, of water main that's being replaced. Um, our storm water program, which you know a lot of people uh, are getting their new storm water bills for, is, is really taking off. Um, mm. You want to just dive in on that a little bit for the folks? So I, I got a couple of calls, so yeah, might as well. So, so the storm water fee is, is, is basically a fee that that allows us to alleviate the issues that are coming from the water um, into the waterways. So all the water that's collected in the streets that goes into the storm drains, the, the idea of, of the program is to, to make sure that water is clean before it enters um, before it enters the waterway. So you know all the, the drainage pipes in the city um, are, have, have kind of been let go for a long, long time. The city has a very old uh, drainage system dating back to the late 1800s. Um, it has not really been addressed, in a, you know, probably since since it's been put in the ground. So we're using this fund to to, to clean up um, all those storm drains and start addressing some of the flooding issues, cleaning some of the rivers, um, cleaning some of the easements where some of the, the storm drains go through. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's new and, and, and exciting, and it's going to be a lot of work, but. Uh, we're, we're getting after it. So. Yeah, it's better late than never. Better late I than know. never. Yeah, I think a lot of um, a lot of things in the city that you know when I came in as a counselor and I imagine when you came in as commissioner, it, it's sort of one of those things where people said, "Oh yeah, we've really had to do that for a while." 
Well, and this and, is and you go wait, what? This is a program that's been discussed for years through you know the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, the program actually was supposed to have taken off in the early 2000s. The regulators couldn't, for some reason, get a handle on what the permit should look like. Uh, but they finally started issuing permits. Uh, we got our permit, I think, in uh, 2018. So, and uh, and to the billing. You know that that comes from the EPA as well. It, you it, know, as part of as part of the permit, it was it was yeah. included in the permit that we uh, that we have a way to pay for it. And it was either through city funds or through a fee. So uh, it's very difficult to, to commit city funds to, to a program like that. It's substantial. Yeah, it, it's substantial. But I think one of the important takeaways is that we're hoping to handle stormwater better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which you know, for for a ward that's dominated by carry Hill, which is the second highest point in Plymouth County, we have a lot of flooding on the hill, so well, it's, it's encouraging to hear. It's important to note too that you know that an, an enterprise fund was established for that, so that all the money that that goes from those fees um, stays within that within that fee. So yeah. you know that that enterprise will hopefully grow in, in, in finance and, and we'll be able to start really addressing some of these issues in the city. Yeah, and it, it stays, you know, that's one of the things that I explain when I talk about enterprise funds is it doesn't go anywhere else. It funds exclusively what it was raised for and that is it. That is it. Um, earlier when I uh, was, was just alone, I guess, interviewing my, myself, um, you know, who says, who says politicians are thinking? Uh, but one of the things that I talked about was uh, the roads and, you know, our, our continuous sort of fight with that. We are way behind the game. Um, and that's another thing I think the DPW has inherited. Uh, I was talking a bit about funding and how we got that. Uh, so I explained that when the gas company, Columbia, now Eversource, uh, you know, does a road, they put in some money, and we, you know, try and get the road done. Um, and I talked a bit about Chapter 90. I did not have time uh, to talk about the other two ways with which we can get a road done, uh, the water and the sewer money, uh, if you wanted to hit that. Oh, so, so, so we have... Uh... The city council appropriated 19.1 million dollars uh, a couple of years ago for us to do water main improvements. Um, currently, this year, uh, I think I said in the beginning, we, we're doing approximately four, four to, between four and five miles of water main. Um, water main on North Main Street. Um, we were fortunate enough to get into the SRF program um, is being replaced, and that's that's two and a half miles of large diameter pipe, 16 inch pipe. Placing uh, the water mains on Frederick Douglass Ave, uh, L Street, uh, Green Street between uh, Main and Warren, and Warren out between West Elm and Pleasant Street. And all those water mains are being replaced to accommodate the public safety building that's coming up. Those mains are, yeah. you know, early 1800s, and we, you know, we can't risk opening that public safety building and have one of those streets fail because when those streets get shut down, it's basically gridlock. Oh, yeah. So, and that's one of the things I believe that same little pocket of money uh, has a provision to do East Ashland as well. We're going out. East, East Ashland Street is, is on our radar. That's probably going to be in the next phase of a lot of work. So. Oh, fair enough. Uh, but no, that's, you know, one of the things about repiping is we can pay when we're done. Um, which is why I always shoot for, I always shoot for, for the money. Um, so, so this year, you know, that... Our focus is to try to kind of reel back in our, our paving program. Um, I've been speaking with the, with the engineering firm to kind of reestablish uh, how we pave in the city. And you know, for years and years and years, the pavement program has been one, run one way. Um, the goal is not only going to be to to go in and repave roads, but it's also going to be um, to, to focus on restoring them or keeping them restored. So like a pavement management program, we will go in and seal roads that were paved three or four years ago. Uh, you know, facts facts kind of tell you that historically, you know, that, that a program like that has a, has a better uh, long-term effect on the uh, total pavement in the city. Did that and, you know, as, as, as we always do, we're addressing, you know, sewer pipes, we're, we're doing two, Two and a half miles of sewer mains this year, relining two and a half sewer, uh, two and a half miles of sewer pipes that will uh, 
cut down our, our total flow at the sewer plant, which will reduce the amount of sewer that we're treating, which will hopefully kind of reel in our, our budget because it's very expensive to treat. One of the you didn't put that on, did you? Uh, I mean, I mean that's a blooper, really. One of one of the drawbacks to um, the checks and balances is the mayor is neither the boss of the council, and the council is neither the boss of the mayor. So we're trying to try to move. The, the department heads have scattered. Human behavior has taken hold. So uh, just corralling some folks. But I am here with the superintendent, Mike Thomas. Thank you, Ham. One of the best superintendents I have ever worked with. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. But um, I, I just wanted to give you the chance to introduce yourself, you know, talk about the job, if you want, how you got there. Sure. And, you know, some of the things that you're, that you're proud of accomplishing or that you're working towards. Sure. Um, so I'm Mike Thomas, Superintendent of Schools. I've been graduated from Brockton High, born and raised in Brockton, Gra Brockton High graduate of 1987. Um, I've been in the school system. This is my 30th year. It's my fourth as superintendent, and um, I'm proud of our students and staff for um, coming through COVID, uh, supporting each other, supporting the families of Brockton. Um, it was it was tough uh, during COVID, but the silver lining is we were able to get a laptop into every student's uh, hands. Uh, we got Wi-Fi to families that needed it during the, during the lockdown and shutdown. So. I'm proud of the work the school system did along with the city uh, uh, school committee, city council, how you know, we just really, everybody supported each other to make sure our families and students were supported across the city. I'm proud of, um, we're going to be getting a new Brockton High School soon, not soon, about six years from now. And I, I mentioned uh, it very exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting that um, every other town around us has gotten a new school and now it's not our turn. Uh, It'll be a long process, but well worth it at the end. So, very excited about that. I'm excited about, um, you know, uh, you know, just the, the parent involvement we've had the last few years, and another silver lining from COVID that really has brought parent involvement up a lot. So, uh, that's that's been really good, and um, I think our students are doing well, recovering from COVID better than some other places, and. Um, and it, you know, there's a lot of learning loss, but I think now they're really uh, starting to come around as we're in back to our second full year back in, in person. So, you know, it's getting better and better. A little, little bit better than the first one. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The remote year was very tough, and then the remote hybrid year was even tougher. And last year, full in person was tough because people really weren't ready to come back together. Yeah. Um, but this year is better. No, I, I, I am... Um, you know, I am. I'm, I never thought. You know, if you were to ask me when I was a student, you know, what would you prefer? Um, I would have. I would have told you I would rather be at home. But uh, after watching, you know, COVID and really exper experiencing that, I am. I am glad that you know we didn't have that that situation to deal with. Uh, you know, there is something absolutely lost. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, when when that kind of thing happens. Yeah, so. Having to learn on a computer is very difficult. It's, it's tricky, yeah. Very so good. especially for the youngest learners. Oh yeah, right. And that's that's you know you're not always you're not you're not just learning what's in the book. You're also learning social, right? You know, social Absolutely. interaction, um, how to treat people like you want to be treated, and a lot of that is is missed when those are just faces on the screen. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so one of the one of the things that I I wanted to you know, explore a bit was the, the new high school. Yep. Um, if you wanted to, to go into it a bit, I wanted, I, I said earlier, talking about, uh, you know, what the Mass School Building Authority yep. is willing to cover and, and what we're doing in our end of it, and, and we're looking to bond that out. Um, so if you wanted to delve sure. into it further. So we, we get accepted by the uh, Mass School Building Authority. They, Brockton gets 80% reimbursement. Um, for construction, and um, so what the next step is, um, you, they, you have to fill out a bunch of paperwork, and then they'll come back and they'll they'll go back to the city council to enter into the feasibility stage, where that's when they um, do a complete study with architects and engineers um, into the current building and see what the best option is for either a new or renovated school. Um, they put a cost on, you know, they put a cost on what that would be. 
uh, and then it, that's about a two-year process, and then it goes back to City Council for um, approval of the what it would cost, um, and then always take into consideration the 80 percent from the MSBA. So uh, it's a long process. I, I've talked to just no one doing work with the MSBA um, and talking to superintendents. Uh, Lynn has a new high school, Lawrence has a new high school, Durfee and Fall River is new, then you have East West Bridgewater. Even pre-COVID, uh, when those were built, it took about six to seven years from the day you're accepted into the program to the day they cut the ribbon. Yeah. So it could be seven to eight years because of construction, Shortages and shortages supplies and, and, and the just, sheer scope of the project. Correct. Yeah. So there's a long way to go, and they MSBA is good to work with. They do a very thorough uh, process that involves uh, elected officials. It involves the community, uh, so they have a say in, in uh, what they want to see, uh, and that includes students. That includes um, just general community members and also parents. So it's a pretty extensive. Right. That two-year time that. That's where all those meetings are taking place with elected officials, with the community, and with the parents and students about what they want to see. You want to say, you know, one thing that you're, you know, one one happy bit of news or something you're you're proud of as superintendent? I gotta I gotta get ready to really. Yeah, sure. Work. The um, one thing I'm proud of is we have right now we have. There's six students that are accepted into Ivy League schools this year from Brockton High, yeah, uh, and uh, several other students will be going to college, so we're just so proud of them. Fantastic. So thank you for having me. Thank Appreciate you, Mr. Students. Thank you. This is surprisingly not all die, uh, but we're getting there. No, but uh, now we're with the superintendent of buildings and the ins head of chief of inspectors. Yeah. I go by many different titles. You have you have as many hats as Pat Hill has sub departments. Uh, yes. Yeah, there are both. I'm hoping but, to get some sub departments. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're working on it. Um, but no, this is Jim Pluff, uh, Ms., Mr. Pluff, Superintendent Pluff. Yes. Uh, if you would like to take it away, maybe a little introduction, a bit about the department. Sure. Sure. Um, well, first thing is I've been here for 22 years, um, working for the city of Brockton. I was a local inspector, um, which is basically construction and code enforcement for the first 19. Uh, three years ago, I was uh, promoted to the building commissioner, and my building commissioner position is also the superintendent of buildings and the clerk of the ZBA, which is the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, as the building commissioner, I enforce um, all the building codes, uh, zoning regulations, and all as associated um, codes that, that go along with those. I have four building inspectors, two wiring inspectors, and two plumbing inspectors for the department. And I have five admin staff who help out with uh, code complaints, uh, answering the phones, doing that kind of work. In addition to the building commissioner position, I have the superintendent of buildings, where I have six or seven, um, I have a shop supervisor and six um, laborers, uh, licensed trades, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, um, HVAC, and they are the ones that are maintaining the city buildings. In addition, I have six custodians who uh, maintain seven buildings, uh, including the Council on Aging, War Memorial, the Shaw Center, and Camp Daly Stadium, uh, the City Hall, and three libraries. So amongst that, I am also the the clerk to ZBA, where I work with the chair of the zoning board to uh, put together the, the hearings we have once a month for variance and special permits and any appeals of my decision. Fair enough. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it's, but it must be fun watching your own decisions get appealed. It is. <laughs> uh, nope. Part of the process. Uh, one of the one of the things that I think the councillors rely on you most for in terms of you know constituent services is uh, the inspectors yes um, and very recently you were sort of given for lack of a better term given custody of the of the health department inspectors as well from the Board of Health uh, which I am pleased to see I think that will you know bode very well um, you know we get plenty of calls and, and emails and, and you know, uh, constituent requests 
about properties, uh, and, and we hand it over to you, the Quality of Life Task Force, and uh, you guys go to work on it. Uh, but I, I'm sure a lot of folks at home are wondering about the process. Sometimes these properties, despite the city being aware of them, uh, hang out for a while. Uh, so, you know, there is, there is a reason to it. This isn't, you know, uh, a procrastination kind of thing. But I, you know, if you want to go into detail about the inspectional services. Sure. Um, well, first I'll, I'll mention that the state of buildings and the state of property in the, in the city of Brockton, if we see it to be less than desirable, um, boils down to one thing I mentioned to one group um, when I was walking around and talking at the tables, and I mentioned this one word for, um, for the table respect. Mm. And it's something that uh, unfortunately is lacking in a lot of the um, a lot of the areas around the city of Brockton. And um, respect for landlords, for their properties, respect of tenants, throwing trash out their window. Um, I think there's an issue of respect. And we really have to get zeroed in and get, get back to that. Um, but as far as inspectional services goes, um, in July, we expect, if the council approves it, to have an special services department formed. Mm -hmm. And this will be through a, um, a, an ordinance change where they take the Board of Health inspectors and place them under my, uh, my official custody. Currently, I house them in my, my office, uh, but as of July 1st, if this passes, we'll be, uh, I'll be the supervisor of those, those, inspect uh, those inspectors. Uh, the four sanitary inspectors and two code enforcement inspectors that uh, roam the city trying to keep up with the, the issues. <laughs> yeah. um, and in addition to that, I'm hoping, that, uh, well, the ordinance will provide for a deputy commissioner and also a superintendent of um, code enforcement, which will help me manage the enlarged office and also manage some of the issues that we're not able to get to right now because of the small staff. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, um, And I, I've been in support of the creation of a dedicated inspectional services department. Um, I also happen to sit on the ordinance committee, so no, I, I am happy to see it coming. Um, you know, I think this is something that will give us another sort of weapon. Yes. Uh, but I, it is it is key. The people being neighbors is is huge. One of the things that I always say on you know uh, in conversations, have you talked to your neighbor? Uh, and sometimes people haven't, and they'll go over and they'll say, hey. I don't appreciate what you've done, or, or you know, this is a bit of a problem. And the neighbor says, "Oh my God, I didn't really think of that." And then they just take care of it. So the the most effective thing is, you know, calling a Mr. Rogers, just being a neighbor. Uh, but you know, where where that fails, and sometimes that does fail. Uh, you know, we have our, our inspectors and our quality of life task force to uh, help tackle that. I know we've had a couple of, a couple of properties in the ward that, that we've been addressing, um, so that's you know always appreciated. Yes. I believe we have a couple of council, we have a couple more uh, ordinances that we're going to be working on. Yes, we, we were just actually working on yesterday together. We were, we uh, were, yeah. And uh, I think that those ordinances will help address at least one of the problems I know that you have in your ward, and maybe uh, several more. Yes. Oh yeah. No, and we're uh, we're working on a couple. So. Uh, Started by really by Councillor D'Agostino, uh, the councillor you know reached out to uh, Commissioner Pluff and said, "Hey, look, uh, you know I, I'd like to do a once-over on some of our, our zoning rules and, and some of our ordinances, and would you help me do that?" Um, so a little bit of a group was formed. I know Councillor Nicastro, now Council President Nicastro, is is part of it. Uh, councillor Farwell and I've been invited as well. We'd go into detail on it, but we might as well do that once they're passed, because we are out of time. Okay. Uh, all right, now we're doing a, a bit of a double feature, because Madam Auditor Karen Paval has to leave. Um, but we also have the Director of Veteran Services, Kelly Young. So, uh, Karen, if you want to, you know, just introduce yourself, talk a bit about the department, and then, you know, you can run, and I'll continue talking with Director Young. Hi, good evening. My name is Karen Paval. I'm the City Auditor for the City of Brockton. I've been in this position for nine months and in city government for more than 25 years. 
my role in the, as the city auditor is to make sure that the city adheres to state and federal reg regulations. Um, we manage paying all of the payroll for both the city and school, along with paying all of the vendors that have provided services to the city. We also ensure that all of our grants are managed and overseen and that all of our contractual obligations with both the state and federal agencies are done in an efficient manner and that we're adhering to all of their different requirements. I'm also in charge of making sure that all of our financial statements and reports are submitted to the Department of Revenue and that you know, we are up to holding and up the standards in terms of making sure we're financially um, consistent and adhering to all the regulations. You also serve as clerk of the uh, City Council's Accounts Committee. Yes. So the, I, the the junior auditors, as I yes, kind of joke. So, yeah. so I am the um, I am the clerk for the Finance Committee, and I also you know um, present different materials for the Accounts Committee. Um, this year, I'm really looking at educating city councils, providing them resources, you know, so that they can, you know, make different, you know, educated and, you know, decisions for the residents in terms of materials and orders that come across their desks. Perfect. I appreciate it, Madam Auditor. Thank you for coming out. I hope this was a, a good experience. It was an experience. excellent experience. I, I think that you know the re it allows the residents and it allows us to provide transparency and you know to ask and answer questions so that they feel comfortable. And I think it also allows us to build credibility in terms of what we do in our jobs, uh, you know, so that people feel comfortable where their money is being spent. Mm -hmm. But I thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed no, absolutely. This opportunity. And you've got. You've got to make a pickup. You've got to do what you got to do, but I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Well, Madam Director, would you like to do a little introduction, a little explanation? Yeah, so I'm Kelly Young. I'm the Veteran Service Officer for the City of Brockton. And so you'll see me around. You'll also see my colleague, Cece, uh, Cecile Gomes. She's the other veterans agent for the city. And our department, the Veteran Services Department for the City of Brockton, we're not the VA. We're not the VA, <laughs> um, so we we work for the city, and what we do is we connect vets, their spouses, any of their eligible dependents, and and anything we can do to help the families of veterans really uh, to their state, local, and federal benefits. So the VA is a, a part of that. There's there are property tax exemptions, there are burial benefits, there are health care benefits, um, but then there are other little fringe benefits that deal with housing, employment mental health, um, pretty much any, any barrier to your life to having uh, like a good, good quality of living. We have a resource, even if it's not our job to specifically deal with that directly, uh, we have a resource to connect you to, to help just make life better. Uh, because if you've ever dealt with local, state, or federal benefits, it can be very frustrating and uh, hidden behind bureaucratic red tape, and our job is to, to rip down the red tape. So what do, we, what do we really do every day? Our, the bulk of our work is uh, filing disability claims and Chapter 115 benefits. So the disability claims are for folks who are in the service and got hurt, sick, um, something happened and they're physically or, or mentally a little different because of it and still uh, dealing with some effects. So we file claims and uh, it's soup to nuts, right? So we start with the initial filing, helping gather paperwork, all the way through if there needs to be an appeal, uh, right until you get um, a decision on the rating. And then Chapter 115 benefits are for folks who are within 200% of the poverty level, which is a very abstract number. So ballpark, if you're a single person, 2200 a month income. A couple, that's about 2800 a month income. Uh, and we provide a, a cash benefit every month for folks who fall within the eligibility criteria. And it doesn't have to be the veteran, it could be a surviving spouse, a child who was disabled uh, before the age of 18. Um, I'm sure you've... So that's like what we do that people don't see. And then when people call us with all kinds of life events that are happening, we try to connect them to other resources. And then 
less frequent, but it does take up a lot of time, are the parades and uh, other veteran holidays that we celebrate. And we also manage about 12 parks, a bunch of stones and, and like squares that are dedicated to veterans, and some of, not all of the flags, but some of the flags in the city. And then all of the veteran graves, whether or not they're um, city cemeteries, we, we take care of the veteran graves at every cemetery in the city. So I'm sure I forgot something, but... A lot, of stuff, lot of stuff there? to yeah. do. So you're not the VA? Not the VA. Not the VA, okay. We play nice with the VA, but we're not the VA. Yeah. Really not, yeah. Nope. So that's, that's an important distinction. Yeah. Um, so when, you know, in the time that you have been the director, um, you know, is, is there anything that really stands out to you that, you know, uh, you know, that you took charge of or, or improved or changed or, or something that you hope to do or work on? Uh, I know you talked a bit about growing the department, something like that, that, that you know, uh, a positive thing, something you're proud of? Yeah, so for a city of a little over 100,000, to have two um, folks representing the vets is, is not enough. Um, other towns with comparable populations and um, like gateway cities like us, you have they have about five people in the department. So there's, there's me and there's CC and we have a vacant administrative assistant position. Um, so there are three people in the department, but we need two or three more to really do a good job. Um, my predecessors have been like fabulous, but I will say one thing that we've started to do that's a little different is we have a survey going around. You can I don't have anything that I can hold up, but if you call me next week, I can tell you the website, or you can go on our Facebook page, or if you get the mayor's newsletter, it's in there, but we have a survey. We've been starting to keep like a database of vets who are still living or related to folks who are in Brockton or vets that we just know about from Brockton because there's no like list of vets or people yeah. that we should be contacting. We don't we, we lose their story. Um, so and I understand. I don't know how much you want to mention it, but you are still currently serving. Yeah, I am. I'm in the Massachusetts Army National Guard. I was doing air traffic control on Joint Base Cape Cod. And I, I was a like a sergeant. I was an NCO, and now I am an officer candidate. Well, congratulations! Yeah. Well, thank you for your service. Thank you for coming. Um, Thanks for having me. We've got to wrap it. It's the end of time. But I appreciate everyone for watching, and uh, you know I want to thank everyone who came out, the department heads, and the and the residents of the ward. And we're on our way. Thank you. It's a long day. But, uh, no, we've got his honor, Mayor Sullivan. Um, you know, Mr. Mayor, I think you of any of the department heads, because you are a department head, uh, I, I think you probably need the least introduction. But if you would like to, you know, provide a bit of an introduction, I understand you're a Brockton guy. Sure, sure, yeah. So my name is Bob Sullivan, uh, born and raised here in the city of Brockton, served 14 years as a city councilor at large, had the honor to serve with, with Councilor Lally. I uh, was elected mayor, um, sworn in January 6th of 2020, and then COVID hit. So I've been mayor since uh, since before COVID, and now we're, we're getting through it. We're not done yet, but I want to thank you, Councilor. I mean, this is a wonderful turnout tonight. I mean, I've, I've been to a lot of ward this meetings is, in all my years. This place is packed. Tonight. This is great, yeah. And I love your format. I mean, it's it's awesome. I, I'm encouraged by it. Yeah. I am, and, and I'm going to be polling people on the way out the door. Good. Um, we had... Next time we'll do a little bit of department head training. You know, we had a couple. We had a yeah. couple spirit off to to different places. Um, I actually burned a significant chunk of the of the interview time. Um, you know, getting people where they needed to go. As a matter of fact, Solicitor Bridges has not <laughs> yet been able to move. Um, but. We've got a couple minutes. We got about four minutes. Um, if you want to talk about, you know, some of the things that you think the general public should know, uh, you know, the folks at home. Your tenure as mayor, you walked right into COVID, but, yeah. but what what have you done that you're real proud of, and, and what are you looking forward to? What's on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we're doing, and, and it's the city council, and it's me as the mayor, um, is we're working together, right? The whole thing is about collaboration, right? And at the end of the day, our whole goals are to have a better community, known as the city of Brockton. So development has been key. One thing that I did as mayor, a lot of mayors in Massachusetts paused construction. They said, we're going to halt everything with COVID. I knew we couldn't do that in Brockton, so we kept construction going. Uh, we did it in a safe way. We met all the standards of, and protocols of COVID. But if you look around the city right now, specifically in the core, that's where it's really focused right now. 
much more development than we've ever seen. And then the goal right now is to go to Montello and Campello and you know all around the city of Champions. So we know that the transit oriented is key. Having three commuter stops, being able to get in South Station, Boston, 35 minutes, close proximity to, to Providence, Rhode Island as well. You know, have a wonderful school system. So again, at the end of the day, something that I'm very proud of. Number one is that we've been able to work together um, to to go through COVID. We lost over 500 people to the deadly virus, but it's through working together that we're going to get to where we need. From a from an economic standpoint, we have a lot more to do. Um, you know, we have to have a cleaner city. The Clean City Initiative is something that I'm really paramount right now. But it's continuing to think outside the box. This tonight is a good creative idea of of being able to brainstorm with folks. You know. You know, the councillor serves, I serve, we serve at the will of the people, right? We're public servants. And so to be able to hear uh, ideas, suggestions, criticisms, all that is why I serve. It's why Jack serves. And uh, again, I just want to thank you for the invitation tonight. This has been wonderful. No, happy to hear it. I am happy to hear it. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of new development, a lot of new things coming into the city. Um, I believe it was 500 new units of housing. Yeah, yeah, we have 500. and. You know, it, you know, the goal right now um, is to continue to harness the, it's transit-oriented development. Yes, yeah. um, we have opportunity zones in the city of Brockton as well. So there are a lot of um, developers that are interested in the city of Brockton. Uh, and, you know, we're going to continue to work with them. We're going to continue to recruit with them. We're going to continue to keep Brocktonians here, but bring new ones in, right? Add to the base, don't subtract. And, Walk uh, and livable yeah, downtown. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. And then... Remember that we have all areas of the city and we need to touch all 28 precincts. So we're going to continue to do that and just want everybody to know I am running again. There's a lot of rumors out there that not. I am running for re-election for mayor and, um, and councilors think, as well. So that's a good thing. Kind of interview we but, can do but, that on. but I can tell you this, right now we are on a path to success. A lot of people call it a renaissance and that isn't just me. That's all of us working together with a shared vision. So I'm excited to uh, keep going. No, we, uh, we've got a lot of encouraging stuff going on, absolutely. Uh, the public safety complex. Um, $98 million, and it's authorized city council. We already have the money. And the superintendent and yep. I talked a bit about the high school. Yep. Um, I, I talked with, with Councillor Azak as well. Um, one of the things that I would like to see, so the, the, the initial plan was to do the, the Cardinal Direction Middle School. Yep. And then the high school. And, and we flipped it on its head and we're doing the high school first, which again, you know, any production is good production. That's right. Um, one of the things that I wanted to explore uh, when we got to the middle schools, and, and the councilor and I have talked about it a bit, is a uh, sort of resurrection of the Montello pool. If we could put that into a redevelopment of North Junior High, I think that would that would be very promising. A lot of the, the pools, despite one being on the east side yep. and one you know being on the southwest corner of the city, they, they're really a, more of a southern half. Of the I, city listen, I used to life so, got yeah. at the Montello and the Campello, uh, which Campello's gone, Montello's gone. I, I think that's a brilliant idea. You know, I do want to also say that a week from tomorrow, on the 24th of February, we're going to have the two sitting uh, senators and Congressman Lynch. Last April, I flew down to Washington D.C. to try to get more money for Brockton, more federal earmarks. And one thing I requested was $3 million for the Cosgrove Pool on the east side, which a lot of people know is, is really the beach in Brockton, right? And it hadn't been really upgraded since it was built. It was built in the 60s. So um, thankfully, um, Congressman Lynch and Senator um, Markey listened to me and worked with me. And so the $3 million request went in and it's signed off by President Biden. So we're getting $3 million on that, uh, that endeavor, which actually is wonderful. It saves uh, any type of other capital expenses we were doing. So I'm excited to be the mayor of Brockton. It's, it's an honor and privilege to serve the city of champions, a place that I grew up in where my wife grew up in where we're raising our children. So I do want to thank Councilor Lally and I want to thank BCA for always filming it and uh, have a great night and uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be working with you and I'll be working for you. Thank you.